All right. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Eric Milliman, and I'm a data scientist at Biogen and the uh, development lead for the risk metric package, which is part of the R validation hub. Um, and today is part one of a two part mini series uh, revolving around the use of risk metric and risk assessment uh, for end to end R package validation. So quick disclaimer, um, all opinions expressed here are my own um, and not sort of reflect those of uh, anybody sponsoring this work, whether that be Biogen, the R Validation Hub, et cetera. Uh, actually, second disclaimer, um, I apologize for any weirdness in the slides. This is my first time with Quarto, and I eventually gave up on some formatting things. So, and... Uh, so quick, I think most people probably know what the R Validation Hub is, but for those that don't, uh, it's a group of approximately 50 companies, mostly in the pharma biotech space. And our mission is to enable the use of R by the biopharmaceutical industry in regulatory settings where outputs from R may be used in you know, things like submissions to regulatory agencies for NDAs or BLAs, among others. Uh, so today we're talking about sort of risk metric and risk uh, the risk end-to-end uh, -end R validation and sort of assessment of risk in R packages. Um, and so that's really right now focusing, uh, revolves around these two tools, risk, risk metric, which is what I'll talk about today, and then risk assessment, which is a shiny app sort of built on top of risk metric, which uh, Aaron Clark, the lead developer of, will speak to next week. I like to start these uh, talks sort of by grounding in risk and what it is, um, because risk, I think, can mean different things to different people. Um, and, and sort of, you know, there are some aspects of risk we control and some we can't. Um, so risk is really a combination of quality and intended use or company culture. Um, I like to give the example that at Biogen, in some of our sort of system designs, we have three levels of risk. That is the system could kill somebody, the system could hurt somebody either temporarily or reversibly, or it doesn't do anything to people and everyone is safe. Um, and quality is obviously one way to mitigate risk, others is process. Um, but what that means is high quality, something like high quality software can still be high risk depending on your intended use. Um, and so really I think of risk um, in sort of two dimensional space where there's a quality axis. So again, if we think of R packages, high quality packages might be something like the tidyverse or base R or it's recommended packages and lower quality packages may be that one-off project the summer intern did six years ago that no one has touched since. So that's like one axis of sort of the risk calculation. And then the other is, I guess some might call it risk, but not to be redundant, I call it the allowed margin of error. And that is, you know, will something that, will the process that I'm performing with said system potentially hurt somebody or will it maybe just cost us a lot of money or does it really not matter because it's completely exploratory and for fun? Um, and so really our risk is sort of the combination of these two, these two aspects. Um, obviously we don't wanna be down in the lower left where we have a very narrow margin for error and we're using very low quality code. And where we really wanna be is towards the top and then you know, left to right is dictated by circumstance. <clears throat> so with that, we have to come up with a criteria to quantify risk or maybe better said would be like quality. Um, and this figure at the top was uh, part of a white paper put up by the R Validation Hub three years ago or so, sort of laying out aspects of software development that could be quantified objectively to get at that sort of first half of the equation in terms of uh, risk. Um, and so those things are, you know, I think pretty, pretty, um, common sense when it comes to software development um, in our pack, you know, in our packages, things like, is there a copyright license? Is the source code available? Is there a maintainer? 
Is there a place for people to report bugs? Are bugs being closed um, or addressed? You know, is there documentation? Is there unit test coverage? How many people are using this package? All sort of indicate are all can all be indicators of sort of high quality, low quality packages, or said in a risk way would be you know a high risk of you know package failure or package error versus not. So I'm going to start by just sort of diving right into a way to use risk metric. Um, it's quite simple. You instantiate with some sort of package ref call, and you can add, you can pass in any number of um, uh, uh, items. You can pass a path to package source directory. You can just name a package, um, and the and then you assess that set of packages, and then you score it. Um, and this package ref function essentially does its best to find metadata information based on what's available in your system. And we get outputs like this, where we have a package, its version, um, and then score and, and metrics, et cetera. Internally, this is sort of the process. So we start with this package ref and the function package ref cache, which aims to collect metadata from different sources store that raw metadata somewhere and sort of as a matter of convenience, be lazy about it so that we don't repeat complex or time consuming computations. Um, you know, we only do that once we say we need that reference, uh, that information to assess the package. From the package ref, we assess the package, which is trying to create an objective set of criteria. Uh, objective, sort of a objective summary of the metadata. Um, and so, uh, for example, that could be summing or creating a table of the number of errors, warnings, and notes from running our command check on a source directory. It could be a table of, uh, it could be a simple binary saying, you know, indicating whether or not a package has a GitHub repo or has a maintainer, et cetera. From the assessment, we then create the metric, and the metric is uh, a um, a numeric, a, nu a sort of a, a numeric score for that individual assessment, um, bounded between zero and one. Um, that sort of indicates for that assessment on um, from sort of low to high in terms of quality or or risk, um, and th there's nothing. To say that we can't create multiple metrics per assessment. Um, for instance, we have an assessment for the number of downloads in a package. Um, um, and we could say just sum the number of downloads over a year, or we could as one metric, and we could also create another metric that say is the um, trend in downloads over that same year as, as a second metric using the assessment. Once we've computed all the metrics for a package, we then can create a score. Um, and that score is essentially the average, uh, the average of all the metrics computed. Again, bounded between zero and one, zero being low risk or higher quality, one being higher risk or higher quality. And of course, we can do things like customize the weights of the metrics for the score. So if you favor, unit test code coverage or downloads, you can sort of bump that weight up to, to your liking. Um, things to consider, I think, when using risk metric, um, and this is sort of in my experience over the last year and a half or so sort of developing and in, in, in discussions. Um, first is package source. So one, not all metrics or assessments are available for all types of package sources. Um, so for instance, uh, if you have a package that you reference that is installed in your library, you will not be able to get assessments for code coverage because unit tests for that installed package are likely not available to run against. Uh, similar for a CRAN remote. So if you are referencing a CRAN, a package, you know, up at CRAN remotely, um, things like, again, uh, unit test coverage may not be available. Um, second uh, is that you have ways to sort of specify 
to be specific about where you want a package ref to be generated from. But if you don't, the, our package sort of does its best to figure out, to, you know, goes through the list of sources and in a specific order to, to reference that. And so what that can mean is you can generate a, a, a list of package refs of, of differing sources, which means that your assessments and metrics may not line up exactly um, for comparison. Um, and so based on that, what that means is, you know, there will be missing information in your outputs. Um, and that missing information could mean different things. So again, if a metric is only imp implemented for a specific source type, um, you know, then it, if it's missing in another ref that's installed, you know, that's probably okay because we couldn't generate it. Um, and again, I give the example of code coverage, which is only available for package source um, as compared to an installed package or even a, a CRAN ref. Sometimes we get parsing errors. I would say generally we've been good about handling that and sort of um, messaging that out in the console, but you know, maybe you expect a metric to be there and it's not. And I would highly recommend if that happens to report it to us so we can figure out you know, why that might be. Um, and then there are others that are maybe sort of not sure how to handle yet or how you know, different people may wanna handle it differently, but there may be times where a metric is uh, missing because it's not expected. So I give the example of a package that may not have a URL for bug reports, which would mean you would not expect some sort of metric on bug closures because you don't know where bugs are being reported. Um, and so you would sort of have one metric in the bug reporting slot, but nothing in the um, closures. And whether that should be missing or maybe a zero, I think is sort of up to the user and, and you know, could have a healthy debate on. Uh, and then lastly, weights. So again, with mixed type sources, um, you know, you might have to be careful with your weighting if you're doing custom weighting, because if a metric is not available and you heavily weight it, then those packages that don't have it available will be, you know, maybe not weighted as, you know, to your um, expectation. Um, and so in this case, I give the example of something like remote check. So one of our metrics is to scrape the CRAN uh, remote checks table um, and report back any, you know, the a score based on errors, warnings, and notes. Um, but you would only expect that for CRAN remotes and not an installed package or source directory. Um, but if you were to overweight it, then those other packages in this, you know, in this example might, you know, not be weighted the same as say the A rules package here. So sort of how it works, things to think about. Um, where we're going uh, right now, we've got sort of four avenues uh, as we move forward. Uh, first is increasing the ease of use. So that's really, a, we're trying to make the package and the, the, the process, the workflow as simple as possible to get people started. So that's creating some more convenient wrapper functions to go end to end say, compute package score and you give it a package and it does that ref assess score type in all under the hood, but provide you with helpful messaging so that you understand what's going on and can sort of learn till you're ready to say, you know, do your own um, sort of customize as you see fit for your, your own workflow. Um, and then along with that is to start cleaning up reporting and output so that you can create nicer looking tables if you wanted to say automate this process um, and do a risk assessment for say 500 packages that you want to validate for your GXP environment or say for all of CRAN just because you wanna have some fun. Second, we're working through completeness. Um, we've got a lot of metrics and assessments implemented sort of the low hanging fruit. And now we're starting to sit back and say, okay, where can we fill in the gaps? And so here in this table, we show sort of the assessment generic calls and then where it dispatches to in terms of source. And there are a lot of NAs, not as bad as it looks because we have a lot of default, but to really start filling these holes in where we can so that we're very explicit in sort of how we link from 
assessment to source type. Um, and so with that consistency and sort of source to assessment to metric, um, thinking about how we might chain or nest sources together to increase metric coverage for your own analysis. And so I sort of propose, we're proposing this kind of diagram where you could from any given source, maybe nest in the next source down, maintaining sort of a chain of custody so that you know if you start with a package um, Fran remote, you could say, if you wanted test coverage, you could nest in the package source information to do test coverage, and then even install the package temporarily if you wanted to do some other sort of, you know, if there were other metrics you wanted to grab. But we wouldn't allow, say, starting with a package install to go back out because there's no way to know when that package was installed and sort of what source code was used to install it or from what sort of snapshot, what, what from CRAN, you know, in sort of what time frame. Um, and, and this will really help sort of, I think, fill out that, um, that assessment table and metric sort of completeness table. Another aspect we're working on is more metrics, but more metrics in a modular way. So one of the philosophies and sort of principles that we try to maintain with the Respectric package is keeping our dependency footprint low. Um, but there are a lot of packages out there that perform sort of similar risk, provide risk metrics, Oyster or SRR, Autotest, PackageNet, all of those provide sort of singular calls maybe to vulnerability databases or extra testing, et cetera. And we want to include those, but not necessarily make the package dependent on them. Um, and so coming up with sort of a framework and API that would allow us to add sort of a light set of functioning that would pull those in if you say have Oyster installed and want to run it. But if you don't, you sort of are, you maybe are told, hey, you don't have this, you could, but if you don't want to, it doesn't sort of break everything down, break, break the workflow. And then also, um, I'm not sure when this might arise, but also providing, you know, easy facility for ad hoc assessments or metrics. Um, maybe you've got some, your company has some super secret proprietary method for assessing risk and you want to feed it into risk metric, but you don't want to share it publicly. That's fine. Um, but, you know, allowing that sort of plugin for private or, you know, non-public uh, or custom on the fly type, type functionalities. And then last is cohorts. Cohorts has been on our roadmap for a very long time. Um, and that's because they're quite difficult. Um, we sort of all, if I say cohort, everyone probably conjures an image of some sort of collection of packages, but you know, really we're working through what that use case would look like, whether it's a set of standalone packages, say the tidyverse that you want to get a singular score for, or if it should be more like installing an environment. So base our priority, the recommended and priority packages, plus whatever you've deemed necessary for the business and you score that entire environment. Um, it, there's sort of one is probably a subset of the other, but which way that goes is I think, you know, we're still sort of working through that design and implementation um, questions. Uh, so that's sort of risk metric. Uh, I just say, if you wanna contribute, we welcome people. Um, you can file issues. I do my best to stay on top and at least discuss them. Um, if you file an issue and you feel you can fix it, by all means, please do. Um, uh, also in our issues pages, you can propose metrics. Uh, we have some good discussions about sort of the pros and cons of specific metrics, um, what they represent, how they might be represented, um, et cetera. Um, and then of course, if you can propose a metric and you feel like trying to contribute it by all means, um, there are any number already proposed that would welcome a contributor. Um, but you know, um, so with metrics, I just thought I'd opine about what I feel makes a good metric. And I think what we've seen makes a good metric and sort of this first phase of sort of singular pass package risk assessment. Um, 
first, I think self-contained is an important one. So what we, in this sort of current iteration, we really focus on that sort of self-contained uh, assessment. Um, and sort of give an example of a proposed metric for license compatibility with dependencies, a good metric, but not necessarily for a singular package, probably more for a cohort where it would be important to know if a packet, if a user facing package has a compatible license with its dependencies. But for uh, just assessing that single package where we don't really assess, we look at the surrounding dependencies, you know, less, less ideal. Um, second, I think is environment agnostic. Again, um, you know, I think to make things as comparable as possible, this is important. And again, uh, would, you know, as you get into sort of environment specifics, that probably leads us more into some sort of cohort style assessment where the underlying architecture or packages installed or versions matter. And this assessment already exists and we're, you know, discussing if it should be moved into, moved over into a cohort metric since running our command check is not only is not a self-contained action, right? It uses, it relies on the version of our installed base packages, dependency package versions, et cetera. And so it's not really as self-contained as it might seem on, on the surface. Um, third, clear interpretation. This is a fun one because it gets into some good meaty discussions. Um, for, and, and I give the example of version release frequency. Um, been proposed a few times that somehow version release frequency is probably an indicator of package risk or quality. Uh, however, it's been difficult to converge on an interpretation of what that means. Um, because you imagine in the life cycle of a package that there would be differences in package and version release frequency. So early on, you might see a lot of releases indicating bug fixes, which means clear engagement by the development team, however, also buggy. And then as a package matures, that frequency probably spreads out, you know, elongates as the, as the package becomes stable. So, you know, I, I think it's clear, but, it, you know, we, it's difficult to sort of get it down to a singular uh, objective criterion. And with that comes this, can, can we represent the metric numerically? And so if we think about revert version release frequency again, you know, how might we represent that numerically, which would indicate sort of monotonic relationship to, to risk or quality. Um, it might be variance in, re in time between releases, but then again, from young packages to old packages, how do you maybe account for stuff like that? So I'm going to briefly introduce a new package that we're in sort of more resource that um, we're rolling out. Um, it's called, we're calling it risk score. Um, it's currently on GitHub. It's highly experimental. So don't base any of your decisions on it. Um, but it essentially a summary is the output of the risk, the risk metric package for all of all of CRAN right now. Uh, we have plans to add a table of assessments as well so that you could sort of play with various aspects and maybe test different kinds of metrics and weights. Um, like I said, only covers CRAN and using the CRAN ref type. So, you know, there's a lot of missing metrics, but as we develop risk metric, we will continue to run to generate this risk score data set. Um, and, and we mean this to be a community resource, um, one, to help contextualize risk scores for end users. So a common question is like, what's a good risk score? What's a bad risk score? Again, I think that depends one on your use case, two on your appetite for, for risk. Um, but this at least would let you sort of put a score in a distribution and see where it falls. Um, and then we also see it as a way to help the development teams uh, monitor changes to scoring algorithms, catch edge cases, um, et cetera. So, um, and, and just generate, I think, a, a nice data set to play with and explore for in the terms of package quality and risk. Um, and I will reiterate, 
not a replacement for doing your own risk assessment, especially now as it's sort of an alpha and needs to be QC'd, but um, is out there to sort of at least investigate. Um, and this actually was first generated by Aaron Clark, who is the lead of risk assessment. Um, and then together we've been putting together sort of table schema and designing what this package would look like along with Doug. Uh, so it just provides some insights from some very basic insights uh, from running risk metric against all of CRAN. Distribution of scores um, across, I think, you know, pretty good and nice you know, relatively uniform distribution, I think is what we'd want to expect when scoring packages. Um, Aaron broke this down by number of downloads. So what you might consider a measure of sort of package popularity, calling out specifically the tidyverse as well as the pharmaverse, and then um, included our, you know, again, by downloads. And as you might expect, the tidyverse of very high quality, um, run by a software development organization. So I think that makes sense. Pharmaverse, not far behind. Again, packages devoted to sort of uh, uh, validated analysis in clinical trial reporting. Um, and then the most top 100 downloaded packages, high quality. And as we move down sort of the rank in terms of downloads or popularity, we sort of see a shift towards higher and higher risk scores, which I think is maybe to be expected. Um, again, in terms of catching edge cases, I just took a look at what's missing um, from these values. We see a lot of complete metrics. However, there are some cases where we clearly had a failure, which we suspect maybe API rate limits uh, calls and stuff like that, which is why this is not ready for production. Um, but you know we're we're working through that. Um, if we look at the binary metric, so has a bug reporting URL, has a maintainer listed, has a website, vignettes, etc. Pretty even splits between um, you know yeses and nos, which I think is good. Um, obviously, for one exception, which has maintainer, which is a requirement of CRAN, so this is. I think sort of to be expected and obviously for a package CRAN ref, not necessarily uh, informative, but for other types of references potentially could be. If we plot pat risk score versus the binary metrics, I think again, you see pretty I, you know obvious trend where when the binary is yes, you tend to have a lower risk score, which again would make sense as having these items would indicate better SDLC practices or development practices. Uh, and we can look at metrics with continuous scores, say bug closure rates, uh, number of dependencies, remote check, some, some of remote check uh, results, as well as reverse dependencies. Um, and again, just varying distributions, but at least you know now a new package comes in and you can sort of say, this is how it looks. Um, if we plot that against risk score, interesting, much less correlated. Um, so not sure what to make yet, but just, I think, informative for you know, planning uh, scoring in the future. And then just for fun, we can take all that, create a heat map, because what is life without a heat map in data science um, and some clustering. And we can just see some pat maybe some patterns start to emerge. I can cut the cut the dendrogram in the rows, which are the packages, to create, say, a couple clusters. And we can plot those scores by cluster and see again there's some relationship between the different clusters and maybe quality. Uh, with that, um, I just thank the dev team, uh, both past and current. Um, it's sort of definitely takes a village um, and we welcome new members, of course, um, even if you have just a small amount of time, every little bit helps um, and with, that, I'd say thank you and take any questions. So 
Can people unmute themselves? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we're in like <laughs> webinar mode or if we're in like group call mode. Um, if you want to ask questions in chat, um, if you can come off mute and you want to ask your question in person, have at it. If you want to answer, uh, ask a question in chat, I'm also happy to kind of like facilitate a little Q&A session and I can read those out. So um, either way is totally fine by me. Maybe I'll just kick us off with a question. So um, how are you seeing, are, are you hearing from organizations that are using this in practice and like, what does their process look like? Um, maybe this is a little bit of a plug for the risk assessment app or other <laughs> alternatives. So there are a couple different ways. I think one is as, so some groups are using not the score, but the individual metrics for decision. So instead of say, reducing a package to a singular number, they're saying, we expect code coverage to be above X and we expect in, you know, downloads or engagement to be above X and sort of using the, the metrics or you know, a, a sort of a non-transformed version of the metric into a rubric that they then sort of binarize themselves. Uh, so that's one thing I've heard. Um, another is to use the score for decision. So we accept, some might say, no, no extra work is needed if your score is below 0.3. Um, and above 0.3 needs peer review and above 0.8, maybe we completely reject outright because it'll be too much work to say mitigate risk. Um, and then I know I've used it to compare packages. So I need to package to do a specific statistical test. I find two that claim to do it and I choose the one with the lower score sort of regardless, I need the, I need the method. So I need a package say without writing my own. So I pick the lower of the two as that would indicate sort of less work on my end to mitigate sort of any, any risk uh, problems. Cool. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a variety also from what I've heard. So I'm also one thing I, I think is also interesting is like, let's say you did write this package on your own for their own statistical process. You know, like what would theoretically, if you were to run risk metric against your own like ad hoc package, it probably is not going to score as well as like either of the two existing <laughs> solutions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's probably better to write extra testing around an existing package then sort of write your own from scratch. Yeah, I only bring that up because this is something we hit up against at Roche occasionally is like, we, we need a particular statistical method. Um, there's like maybe a few packages out there, but it's a niche statistical field with maybe a couple uh, little used packages out there. And there's this question around like, what is the risk of using these packages? And yeah, they might be high risk, but the risk of like not using them is often higher than the risk of like using them, maybe finding issues with them and being able to contribute back to it and actually like build that up as a, uh, like starting from that as, as a starting point for a like um, low risk solution. So yeah. yeah, cool. I think it fosters, uh, I hope that that fosters like a more, um, uh, an atmosphere around contributing toward uh, existing projects. Yeah, me too. Um, the other thing I was kind of curious about was if you're planning to like keep a running like roadmap with all these, um, like the, you mentioned this big list of like this matrix that you're trying to populate, um, is that visible somewhere or should we make it visible somewhere? We need to make it visible somewhere. We've, we've got a few project boards up and running, um, which I think some are linked in the slides somewhere, wherever that was. Um, especially when contributing. Um, but this this list, this table of completion is actually a request. It's a request from the risk assessment team so that they know. Um, and I think it's a useful, just a useful resource for people when when running risk assessment, risk metric to know sort of what to expect coming out because we had a case where uh, somebody was, comparing to and getting different scores than somebody else. And part of that was like, 
somebody was doing two comparing two package CRAN remotes and somebody was comparing a package install to a package CRAN remote. And so like the metrics were different because they were using different sources. Um, and so I think providing that says, oh yeah, you know, making that clear, like this is not available to you um, is, is important. Um, I'm also just like the, the developer in me can't resist thinking about like how to handle this problem. <laughs> and one idea that comes to mind is to interpolate these NAs uh, with like, or to impute these NAs with both like the lowest risk and the highest risk, and then compare, like give a range of what the risk could be if these metrics were populated. Yeah. Just an idea. We can talk yeah, about yeah, that yeah. later. <laughs> I'm not seeing other questions rolling in. Um, so maybe it sounds like the material hopefully was clear and that I'm, I'm hoping that people are walking away with a better understanding of where the project's at and how they can contribute, um, how they can use it in their own practice. And um, definitely you, there, it's very clear that there's like a, a lot of work ahead. I think it's it's really impressive where it's at. And I, thought, I think having all this analysis now around the metrics has been like super informative. Um, so hopefully if you're using this at your organization, um, this is something that's already proven productive. And if you need more support, um, you, now you know how to kind of feed that information back to us um, or contribute would even be better. Um, and uh, coming up in just a week, we'll have a discussion around uh, a graphical user interface that's wrapping around this tool um, that is maybe more friendly to people that don't have um, deeper R backgrounds to support this um, actually being embedded in your uh, business workflow. So um, we'll have that to look forward to. Aaron Clark will be presenting on the risk assessment app. Were there any other logistic items that we wanted to hit on before we close out for today? If not, um, then I will invite people uh, back in about a week's time, um, this time next week. Um, to join us for the risk assessment discussion. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending and we'll hope to see you next week. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.